Um, very good. So thank you all for coming virtually to this seminar. And thank you very much to the organizers for this opportunity. Um, so I'm going to be telling you about some recent work with my student, Nikos Stefanidis, uh, here at the Max Planck Institute for Complex Systems in Dresden. Uh, and it's about the possibility of certain exotic states that could arise in, in, in more superlattice uh, materials that are some type of uh, Laughlin states made out of excitons. Uh, so I guess this audience doesn't need an introduction. Um, we already had some quite nice introductions in the first sessions by Andrea and by Ashbin. Um, but let me just briefly mention that the, the system that I have in mind basically is magic angle twisted by layer graphene. Uh, when the two sheets of graphene are misaligned by a small twist angle, the more super lattice arises and uh, a variety of correlated insulating states and superconducting states have been seen. And for purposes of this talk, I'm going to be focusing on essentially the quantum anomalous hole state uh, that was seen by, by the group of um, Andrea um, near this feeling factor three. So basically when we start from the band insulator, we can think of this state as the state that arises when we add one hole for every uh, more super lattice unit cell. And uh, as he was telling us, this state displays some very good uh, quantization of the whole conductivity. So it's uh, an anomalous quantum hole state. And so basically what I want to tell you about is about an, an alternative um, possibility for, for the state that is being realized there, which we might say the default explanation for that state is, is just a, a, a spontaneous integer quantum hole state, so a churn magnet. I'm gonna show you that even though that's a very reasonable candidate, uh, that, that state is in close competition with some other more interesting states, if you wish, which we call this uh, the excitonic Laughlin states. And these are uh, states that feature uh, fractionalization of the Bali number of graphene. So they, they, they have uh, anions that carry fractional Bali numbers. These are neutral particles. So it doesn't feature any charge fractionalization, only Bali fractionalization. And remarkably, uh, this state uh, displays the same electrical, um, the same quantized electrical hole conductivity as the, as the churn magnet. So it's a, these are states that are very hard to distinguish from the churn magnet just um, by, by charge uh, transport type measurements. But I'll show you that they have a very interesting feature and is that they have, in addition to this charge mode, they display a counter propagating um, neutral mode. Uh, so they might be distinguished uh, by heat transport measurements. Um, and these ideas are actually uh, in very close overlap with ideas by, by C, C. Paramesvaran and Steve Simon and collaborators who put out a paper uh, maybe just a few uh, days before us. So I was uh, scared when I saw their paper, the, the uncanny resemblance to some of the ideas uh, we had. So, uh, and, um, so let me just describe um, what is the idealized setting in which I'm going to be thinking about these states. And it's basically, you know, a recapitulation of the kind of things that Ashbin was uh, describing very well in his talk. And so the idea is that we have a, a magic angle twisted by layer graphene on top of a hexagonal boron nitrate substrate. So it's aligned with the boron nitrate substrate. And this uh, leads to a splitting of the mini bands into two very flat churn bands. This is basically the band structure that you would have for a single spin and valley. And uh, so we will have basically a copy for each of these churn bands for the 
other valleys, so a, a total of eight uh, very flat bands uh, that come in these uh, pairs. Uh, for each valley, there is a, a corresponding band in the other valley with the opposite churn number. And so to understand this, uh, or to, to describe these states, I'm gonna make another simplifying assumption, and it's that I'm going to, to assume that the physical spin is polarized uh, so that I can focus essentially in the simplest model, the, the simplest minimal model that is consistent with time reversal symmetry at this feeling factor, which is a model that is just comprised by two very flat uh, churn bands with opposite churn numbers. So I'm gonna assign some pseudo spin label to these two bands. And, uh, and furthermore, I'm gonna make the simplifying assumption that I can just view them as, as Landau levels. So I'm gonna take this uh, Hilbert space of interest to be consisting only of two Landau levels, essentially the Landau levels that you would have say for parabolic electrons, but uh, uh, considering that they would be subjected to opposite magnetic fields. So there is a pseudo spin index here that takes opposite values plus and minus one for the two values. So, so we have basically two Landau levels for particles experiencing opposite magnetic fields. And uh, the, 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 the idea will be to solve the many body problem in this uh, Hilbert space. And we are going to take also the interactions to be just uh, Bali, Bali diagonal. So we are going to assume that we have some interactions that are maybe dependent on the Bali numbers in the sense that, you know, particles that are in the same Bali have different repulsions of, uh, than particles that are in, in different valleys but there is no, no, no inter-valley uh, scattering. And uh, uh, the, at, at, the, at, the, at this moment, the, the, the only general assumption I wanna make is that these interactions are repulsive, okay? So that's essentially the model, the ideal model that we are going to be trying to understand. And so this problem has um, several important symmetries, uh, which are the separate valley number conservation, as I mentioned, the time reversal symmetry. So, you know, we can uh, uh, reverse the sign of magnetic field and, and exchange the values, and that is a symmetry of the problem. And it also has a particle hole symmetry, which uh, reverses the direction. It's a global particle hole symmetry of this, let's say, uh, manifold of two Landau levels in which you reverse the sign of the magnetic field, the effective magnetic field for the for one of the valleys, for, for, for both valleys and also exchange the valleys and exchange uh, particles and holes. And so before we go into the many body problem, let me briefly review the two body problem in this, uh, in this setting. Um, so if we have two particles that are residing in the same valley, um, basically we will have the problem that we have uh, typically in Landau levels. So these two particles will have a definite angular momentum. They will start orbiting around each other. And this happens essentially because, you know, by Newton's third law, the repulsion forces between the two electrons are um, opposite to each other along the line that joins the two particles. And then the drift velocities are basically orthogonal to these forces and in opposite directions. So the particles just start orbiting each other and the states of definite angular momentum have certain energy costs which are labeled by, by Haldane pseudopotentials. Um, when we put particles in opposite valleys, then this problem changes uh, completely uh, because now the two particles, even though they are experience, experiencing opposite repulsive forces by, by Newton's third law, they will have a common drift velocity, right? So this drift velocity is just essentially the, 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 the analog in the case of flat Landau levels of the anomalous velocity that you would have in a, in a more general churn band. Uh, so in this case, you know, the particles will have common drift velocities and they will move in, in straight lines, you know. So in a sense, the particle-particle problem of particles in opposite valleys resembles a little bit what you have in Landau levels for particles and holes. Okay, the particle-particle problem looks like the particle-hole problem that was uh, solved many years ago, and 
you can solve the problem completely algebraically without solving any differential equations just by using the algebra of um, operators inside lambda levels and this there is a distance that separates the particle and that locks to the momentum and given that distance then you can compute the, the, the energy of the two body problem. And so the many body problem in which we're going to be focusing on is uh, the many body problem and total feeling factor one. So we imagine that we put as many electrons into these two uh, bands, into these two lambda levels uh, as, as the number of states, as the number of flux quanta. And so various people have already pointed out in the literature that a very good state is uh, a state in which the particles all occupy a common valley. So that would be a spontaneous integer quantum hole state and is in turn magnet. Uh, and this state in particular is much more favorable than the kind of states that you have in quantum hole by layers that would be a sort of analogs of exit on condensates in which the particles would tunnel between the two flavors because this state uh, has a much, a much better chance to gain exchange energy from the Pioli exclusion principle in this case. So basically what you find within hartree fock is that if you take any model in which the intra-valley interaction is identical to the inter-valley interactions, this is going to be the ground state, the easing chair magnet. Um, and you know, you can make this arguments even much more robust than hartree fock For example, you can prove that this is not only, an, this is always trivially an, an exact eigenstate just by conservation of total part of the total valley number. But you can also prove that it's a unique uh, zero energy state for an interaction that only has um, contact interactions intra-valley and has any repulsive interaction inter-valley. So this is just to basically say that this is a very good state for a large class of repulsive interactions. But we want to find ways to, to, to realize more interesting states. So let's consider the excitations that you can construct on top of this state. So let's take it, suppose we have this ground state and let's consider the particle hole excitations that you will construct on top of this ground state. So you have, essentially you move one, remove one particle from the occupied uh, Landau level and you put it into the opposite Landau level. So to understand this problem, it is convenient to perform a particle hole conjugation of the valley that is initially occupied of the reference vacuum. So that, that state becomes essentially empty. It becomes an actual vacuum. That particle hole conjugation will reverse the magnetic field so after performing this particle hole conjugation, the vacuum will look like a vacuum of two Landau levels, but in, now in a common magnetic field. And the particle hole excitation now looks like basically a two particle problem in a total magnetic field. Uh, however, the, the difference with the usual two particle problem in a total magnetic field is that now the particles will be attracting each other. The, the electron and the hole will be attracting each other. In addition, after performing the particle hole conjugation, there is some one body terms that you generate from the exchange and Hartree energies. And so basically you can then solve the problem by again appealing to symmetry. So you will get a bunch of Haldane pseudo potentials for the relative angular momentum of this, the various states of relative angular momentum of this electron and hole. Uh, the energy of the state in which they have infinite angular momentum, so when they are infinitely far away from each other, measures the charge gap of this exit on condensate. And then the state, typically if the microscopic interactions are repulsive, then the state with the smallest angular momentum would be the lowest energy state for the exciton. So the, the, the one in which the electron and the hole are closest to each other since they are attracting. And so, you can write down the energies for any microscopic interaction you want just by appealing to the notion of Haldane pseudo potentials. And then the idea is that in order for the easing magnet to be stable, these energies of all these excitonic states should be positive. If they become negative, then the excitons would want to appear spontaneously out of vacuum. They would like to proliferate. And so if you take Basically, almost any interaction that you can think of 
in which particles of the same valley have the same repulsion as particles as of opposite valley, such as this one that is not a good model for the screen Coulomb interaction from a gate. What you will find is that the exciton condensate is, is always stable. So this exciton gap remains positive. The, the excitons do not want to proliferate. So in order for them to proliferate, in order to stabilize this state, you, what you need is that the intra-valley interactions are a little bit stronger than the inter-valley interactions. And this is intuitive because, you know, once they, you're polarizing all the particles into a given valley, so, so once this repulsion becomes too strong, they might want to be polarized. And so, for example, like if we take some toy model for the corrections of the short distance interactions um, to be just given by Gaussian interactions, um, this is a phase diagram showing how the a line at which excitons proliferate depends on the range of the interaction and on the ratio of this intra valley to inter valley interaction. So eventually at the blue line, excitons pro proliferate. And so, you know, it is reasonable to expect that twisted by layer graphene is close to this point here labeled by one one, namely that, you know, these interactions are very close to each other and the, 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 the range of the interaction is comparable to the magnetic length, which is essentially comparable to the, to the more distance when you convert to, to back to, to original um, units. Um, but the point that I want to emphasize essentially is that the critical interaction needed to stabilize the exciton, the, the, the easing churn magnet is not too big in a sense. So by having uh, uh, an intraval interaction that is 30% larger than the interval interaction, you would be able to stabilize it and go into a state in which excitons would proliferate. So once excitons proliferate, we need to ask, you know, what do they do to each other? How do they interact with each other? So in order to understand that, let's construct some two exciton state. So here I am writing down a wave function for two excitons, which is essentially the most uh, compact two exciton wave function you can write. So it's essentially an, a wave function that will tell you wh how, wh what is the nature of the short distance interactions between the excitons. So you can think of this wave function as a, as a kind of little bubble of uh, the, let's say if the, if the reference state was churn number minus one, this is a little bubble of churn number one state constructed on that reference state. Or, or if you perform this particle hole conjugation of the occupied state, it essentially looks like a little bubble of a new equals two state embedded in a new equals zero state, since now I have particle hole conjugated the occupied states so that it looks like vacuum. So that, that because it's a new equals two state, it's a later determinant, so that makes it a bit easier in terms of calculation. So you can compute the energies of these two exciton state relatively easily. And so we can then decompose the energy of these two exciton state into the energy of two individual excitons plus the inter exciton interaction. And so what I'm showing in this plot here is the line at which the inter exciton interactions change from attractive to repulsive. And something quite interesting we found is that that line coincides exactly with the line at which the excitons pro proliferate in the case in which the interaction potentials have the same range. So the, the idea is that as soon as excitons proliferate, they become, they start to repel each other. As soon as they pop up out of vacuum, they, they start to repel each other. Uh, that it's not always the case. So if you were to assume, for example, that the ranges of interactions were slightly different, then the, the boundaries will be different. But for some reason, I don't understand if there is any deep meaning to it. When the ranges of interactions are common, only the strength is different. Then the, the, the line at which they change from attraction to repulsion coincides with the proliferation line. And so what we would like to do is to view these excitons as if they were elementary bosons, as if they were bosons uh, and to do that, then we all, we, we, we need to make sure that the inter exciton interaction is not larger than the energy that is needed to ionize the exciton. You know, the energy that is needed to take it from its bound state at m equals zero to, to the charges being at infinity. And so basically this purple line is, 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 is that line at which the, the, the inter, in, the exciton interaction becomes comparable with the, with the binding energy of the exciton. So it's essentially the exciton ionization line. 
But you know, the point that I want to emphasize is that there is a big chunk of space on which excitons proliferate, repel, and they are still relatively strongly bound so that you can view them as elementary bosons, okay? So that allows us to simplify the problem. And in this region, we can view the problem essentially as the problem of interacting bosons. And again, these are bosons that are living in a, that, 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 are, that are moving essentially in a net magnetic field. The excitons behave as if they, as if they were charged particles in a magnetic field. And they are repelling each other. And they have a finite density in that region. And so basically they can do two things, okay? So they will either bigner crystallize or they might form Laughlin, Laughlin type states, okay? So maybe over some small sliver here, they might, where their exciton density is small, they might form bigner crystal type states, but eventually once the exciton density is sufficiently large, Laughlin states should win, just in the same sense of, you know, by, by analogy to how it happens in a lambda level, that the bigner crystals are only winning at very low densities. So let me, this other possibility has been considered by other people, so let me focus on this possibility of the Laughlin-like states, okay? So because the excitons are bosons, uh, in order for them to form Laughlin states, the exciton filling fraction defined as the number of excitons divided by the number of flux that the excitons experience should be a fractional number with an even denominator because the, the excitons are bosons, okay? Uh, and the excitons are essentially just the spin flips, okay? The number of flips that you're making on top of the churn number of the churn magnet vacuum, okay? So by combining that, what you will find is that these states are the states that have the same total filling of the churn magnet, but they have a fractional value polarization, okay? Uh, and the one that is, that contains the most excitons, the one with the densest number of excitons that you can construct is actually an analog of the Laughlin state, bosonic Laughlin state one quarter, which remarkably is a completely valiant polarized state. So that's the state that corresponds to M equals two. So it has the same polarization for, for, for so it has the same number of electrons on the two valleys. So, you know, what makes them interesting? So one interesting property of these states is that they have anion, anionic excitations, just like Laughlin states do. Um, so, so, but these, the quasi-particles, these anions will not, will, will carry only fractional number of, of the exciton number, okay? They, they carry a fractional amount of excitonic density, in a sense. But they are charge neutral, so they, they carry the same fraction of, 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 of um, you know, quasi-electron and quasi-hole charge if you wish. So, so they are charge neutral. They only have valley fractionalization. So you can view the, maybe the uh, 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 cartoon of these states uh, and, and a cartoon of the quasi-particle, if you take a slice around some particular direction of the, of the density, is that let's say at the quasi-hole, basically the quasi-particle, the, the, the state will try to, to go back to the easing churn magnet filling in which you're only occupying one valley and the other one is depleted and far away from it, you have this fractional valley polarization. Okay, but these quasi-particles, even though they carry fractional value numbers, they, they don't have charge fractionalization. So they carry charge charges that are quantized in integers of, of the electron charge. And uh, a closely related property, which I will go, uh, I will comment a little bit more in the next slide, is, is that they have the whole conductivity to be exactly quantized to be the same as the, as the, as the parent is in churn magnet. This is a state that is valley and polarized, the one that I mentioned that has the highest density of excitons, you can prove that even though it's valley and polarized, it's time reversal, it breaks time reversal symmetry. This can be argued very precisely. For example, if you put the state in the sphere, and the sphere needs to have, this state has an odd number of fluxes. And in order to be time reversal invariant, one can prove that it needs to have an even number of fluxes. So it's a, even the, the, the state that is valley and polarized breaks time reversal symmetry. And so one of the uh, really interesting properties of these states is that they have a, a rich structure in the edge, okay, of the edge excitations, which in a sense resembles the behavior of the, of the two third state in, 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 in fractional quantum hole state. So because they are constructed by 
inducing spin flips of, on top of the of the easing churn magnet vacuum, uh, you basically end up with an additional bubble of this Laughlin state on top of the big, uh, let's say, blue region here, which would be the the the, the easing churn magnet. So what I'm trying to say is that the state the state is separated from true vacuum by some strip of the easing churn magnet. Okay. And so there is various ways to argue this formally maybe, but let me try to give you a rather an intuitive picture of why this happens energetically, okay, that, that the uh, state uh, has actually this double edge, okay, it has a, a charged edge with vacuum which resembles the one of the in chair magnet, and in addition it has an internal excitonic charged neutral edge. Into uh, about so, five minutes. Yeah, very good. Um, so the idea can be understood more or less as follows. So, so the, the, the confining potential, okay, the, the, the potential that originates from the wall that is confining the particles to this region uh, acts equally on particles on both valleys. So as a consequence, it produces forces that are opposite on the electrons and the holes, okay? So this confining potential in a sense this favors the excitons because it tries to ionize them because the forces are opposite. It's trying to rip them apart. But however, exchange potential, so a potential that would be opposite on the two valleys would have, will induce common forces on the electron and the hole. And as a consequence, it will just induce some drift for the excitons. So this is essentially what happens in this internal ledge, okay? The exchange potential induces self-consistency and, and neutral drift a neutral current of drift associated with drift of excitons and then the, the external potential just induces the, the, the charge current for the, for, the, for the outer edge. And so even though you might not be able to distinguish then these states from the easing churn magnet by charge transport, then you might be able to distinguish them by heat transport because uh, heat is able to, you know, charge cannot backscatter from the charge edge to the neutral edge, but heat can uh, scatter essentially or can be transferred between the two edges. So on very long samples, this state will have zero hole, uh, zero heat conductance. Uh, unlike the, the Easing churn magnet will have will have a quantized uh, heat conductance. So, so the Easing churn magnet will be a, a, a similar to an integer quantum hole state, whereas this state will be similar to a two thirds fraction of quantum hole state. And that's you know basically the summary. So we have some Possibility of an interesting state that is in, I would say, reasonable competition. It's, it's a reasonable candidate to compete with the Easing Churn magnet, which features some fractionalization of Bali number, but the quasi particles have still integer uh, quantization. It has the same, more or less the same electromagnetic properties, the same uh, charge transport, but it might be possible to distinguish it from the Easing Churn magnet by, by measuring the heat transport because it has no heat transfer on very long, should have no, no heat transfer on very long samples. And with that, let me thank you. Thank you, NT. Um, any questions? Uh, go ahead and raise hands. Uh, all right, Senke. Yeah, actually, uh, so, so is there any like, a simple slate particle kind of construction for, for this state you're talking about, like you fractionalize out the, uh, like the charge part and the, and the value part. Yeah, so value. you know, I, it's very simple in the end. It's just um, these excitons, right, are just the spin flips of the magnet. Um, so they, they are bosons, right? So I'm just making a bosonic Laughlin state of those excitons, essentially. Yeah, but then this this uh, this object will be neutral, but eventually you still have to get uh, like a, uh, a charge hole conductivity. Uh, exactly. So so you know you you since you need to construct construct it on top of the a churn magnet, then you will have left over the, the the charge of the of the churn magnet. So in a sense, you know, it's like you have the integer quantum hole uh, state, and on top of it, you're inside of it, you are you are uh, adding a, uh, some neutral particles uh, that are forming a Laughlin state. Yeah, okay, okay, fine, yeah. A 
you not. If you want to ask your question, go ahead. Um, yeah. So, what? How? How would this exotonic state that you are proposing uh, respond to uh, inhomogeneity, such as like the twist angle variation and so on? Any thoughts? Um, the twist angle. Yeah. Um, I mean, the twist angle would be detrimental in general. As it, it is detrimental to but, the. Yeah, go ahead. You know, I, I I I feel like um, it will not be so detrimental to this uh, sort of anomalous hall picture because uh, that's kind of very local. Um, but this exotonic pic picture seems to require perhaps more coherence, or maybe I'm not getting it right. You, I, you know, as long as you your twist angle is not doing a, a substantial change to the picture of the flat churn bands, right? Mm. So the problem is how, how 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 sensitive you know your your bands are to the to the twist angle, right? In a sense, mm. but if it if it if you still have a, a flat churn bands, I think it should not you know it will not be so important you know, to the extent that you can keep the picture of flat churn bands it should not be that important let's say but it, it, i suspect it is important for that point right so hmm. okay thank you Sid? Yeah. Oh, yeah thanks andre i just wanted to comment on uh, i think uh Chenke's question so i think one possible for uh, useful point on that uh, i think indy uh, mentioned it very clearly but um, the kind of wave function you get is something that uh, you can think of as uh, taking two uh, fermionic quantum Hall states and then binding the fermions into a tightly bound S-wave boson in this language. So it's something that was actually, uh, surprisingly enough, uh, Bert Halper and wrote, sketched the story like this way back in, I think, 1983, or in, sorry, way back in the early days of fractional quantum Hall, so I think the late 80s. Uh, there's some papers that actually talk about this, and there's an obscure reference to that, but that's actually the first place this kind of wave function was discussed in some sense. But there was an explicit form of the wave function in that language, uh, but basically the idea was uh, take two uh, electrons in lambda levels, tightly bind them into bosons, and then put the bosons into a bosonic Laughlin state. They're sort of the words are there in some old uh, Halpern paper. So just flagging that if anybody's interested. Herb. Yeah. So, so this state, um, to get it, it calls for this um, v up down, I guess, to be uh, smaller than the v up up. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just sort of wondering how how it can be realized, and in particular, yeah. I guess, wondering if there's like a two layer version of this, where you know that yeah. something like that might be natural. Yeah. Yeah. So I think this is. You know, the most natural situation is that the interactions are identical because the problem here is that the values are related by time reversal. Mm -hmm. So if you take density, density interactions, um, you know, if I make a bump here, uh, when I apply time reversal is, you know, gonna map to the same bump in the other value, right? So the, then from the time reversal makes density, density interactions to be very close to each other, the intra and inter value interactions. Um, it, here is something that is a bit very, 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 very speculative. So, 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 you know, the short answer is it's hard, right? So I don't know how to make one much stronger than the other, but let me maybe speculate a little bit, okay? So maybe one possible way to get very different interactions is to understand uh, what happens. You know, so the, the, the main difference between the particles is that this particle here is like a little, um, you know, I would, it's a, it's a, it has a, a wave packet that is sort of, you know, when you make it localized, it's spinning in one direction, whereas the other one is a little wave packet spinning in the opposite direction because they have opposite uh, orbital magnetism, right? So in a sense, they are little loop currents that are spinning in opposite directions. So if there is some interaction between loop currents, I would mm -hmm. get, I, I could get, you know, after I, 
do a proper calculation that goes beyond density density interactions i suspect one might get something in which you know uh, loops that have opposite uh, uh, spiraling uh, try to attract each other whereas loops that are spiraling in the same direction that are in the same valley try to repel each other a little bit so that that will give you this effect okay it will make the particles of the same valley repel a little bit more than the particles of opposite valley so that mm -hmm. that could be something that is that is that, that could push you in this direction but mm -hmm. just density density interactions projected into the band will very likely leave you with this being very close to one okay thanks How about Oscar next and then Efron? Um, how sensitive is the energetics to using the Lois Landau level wave functions versus uh, the actual Moray wave functions? Um, actually, Sid could comment on this because he, in his paper, did, I think, some look into that. But let me maybe just say that I. Yeah, I think it's an important detail, but it all it's all about, you know, how. What is the range of the interaction essentially um, is the main contribution, right? Is, this will give you a form factor for the wave function. So it will give you a size of the, of, the, of, the, of the effective, it will correct the size of the effective interaction. Uh, but I don't think uh, I have a very sharp answer to, to how it affects quantitatively, but maybe see, I don't know if you did look into this. Oh. Thanks, Inti. Uh, so, Oscar, I think Inti gave the perfect answer. I think it's not very clear. It seems like it should be stable. What we did look at is uh, the equivalent of the single exciton calculation that Inti did. So what we did do is map out the Berry curvature of the lowest lying exciton state across the Bilwan zone. And that turns out to be somewhat non-uniform. And also, if you actually take the twisted bilayer graphene, so it turns out defining the excitonic Berry curvature of this two particle bound state across the Bill one zone is fairly subtle. And one of the points we found is that it actually depends on substrate potential. So while there's a lot of berry curvature, there's no guarantee that it integrates to one across the Bill one zone because there's sort of additional effects from the envelope function and all that. So at the single particle level already, there's some subtlety. What we haven't done is do any kind of many body calculation involving the full lowest lambda level wave functions. That seems to be, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Moray wave function. That seems to be quite tricky. One potential thing that I guess uh, I haven't asked Inti if he's done is whether he uh, just take a single particle kinetic energy in his variational calculation of the Landau level. That's a little bit uh, sort of going from the Landau level limit towards the um, Moray limit, but in a different way. Thank you. I don't know if Mo uh, Inti has results on that. No, I mean, what we did, we, we, I suspect, you know, the, this precise Landau the level form factor will just alter essentially the range of a potential a little bit, but it should not be a big chunk of the energy, I think. It's comparable yeah, to the I guess I'm more worried the, about the, the berry curvature. Uh, yeah, the sorry, uniformity of the berry curvature. Okay, yeah, that's a different Yeah, point. I think I'm more worried about that effect, and that you can also get yeah. from putting in a dispersion. But yeah, but I think a dispersion may also potentially help stabilize the excitonic states. Because if you look at the Hartree Fock results, a partially polarized metal becomes stable as you add kinetic energy. So if you look at Mike's early Hartree Fock papers, so one question is potentially since a partial partial polarization and a metal is being favored with the kinetic dispersion, maybe some kind of partially polarized insulator might be favored in that limit. Maybe last question then from uh, Efrat. And then we can open it up for general discussion if anybody wants to stick around. Uh, yeah, hi. So I, I wanted to ask um, um, what would be the effect of a, a real magnetic field if you apply on this state? Um, so the magnetic field, you know, um, the magnetic field will try to, to, to add fluxes to one of the flavors and remove fluxes from the other flavor. I mean, there is various effects, right? So the magnetic field has a single particle effect. So it will split one valley relative to the other. So there's a single particle splitting. So it adds some semant type splitting. But in addition, it has maybe a more interesting effect that is the orbital effect, right? So it, it will add states to one band and remove states from the other, right? Um, 
uh, generally speaking, you know, if the magnetic field is not huge, you should be able to do the construction still, uh, you know, provided you start from the, from the, from the parent churn magnet that you're select, selecting by the magnetic field. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, constructing the excitons on top of that parent churn magnet. Uh, okay. Okay, so then I would say we will call this session over. And um, if anybody wants to stick around, they're welcome to continue discussions. But otherwise, uh, we will reconvene this workshop uh, tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Pacific time uh, and have four more interesting talks. So bye, everybody.